please stand for the reading of God's word. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on Sabbath he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away! What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly. Come out of him. Then the demon, demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, What words these are? With authority and power, he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out. And the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent down over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. At sunset, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sickness, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Moreover, demons came out of many people shouting, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Messiah. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. The people were looking for him, and when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. But he said, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also because that is why I was sent and he kept on preaching in the synagogues of Judea blessed be the, the words of God Peter, thank you Rob thank you worship team good morning Harvest Ridge it's good to, uh, to be with you again this morning um, we are continuing through our series on the Gospel of Luke. We're preaching passage by passage. Uh, we began in Advent, starting with Luke chapter 1, and we're going to uh, continue preaching and seeing how Luke tells the story of Jesus. Um, and particularly, I'm wanting to focus as we go on the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, and what the kingdom of God is, and how it shapes our lives, and how it influences the way that we live here and now, today. We live in a tumultuous, stressful, just busy society, busy world. Um, it seems like parents are always on the run. Uh, youth are doing a million events. There's tasks that always need to get done. We have bosses that are impossible to please. There's family conflict issues. There's health issues, health concerns. There's concerns for safety and security. Then there's money, and then there's financial worries, saving for retirement, getting kids through college. Is anyone feeling anxious right now? Has anyone's blood pressure been raised a little bit? Um, and as if that's not enough, then you turn on the news, and there's coronavirus, and there's another mass shooting, and there's um, everyone's favorite topic, politics. Um, in fact, like, this is a topic I know there is a lot of strong emotions about in our society, and I remember saying from the beginning of the series that um, I am not a person who brings politics from the pulpit. I'm very strongly against that. Um, but there's a lot of emotion in our society regarding this. Um, I find it interesting that, like, um, we have a lot of people, m many people, who feel like um, their side, their party is the one that's right and true and correct, and it's the other party that's terrible and awful and gets everything wrong. And then you have a few people who are kind of that, um, just a complete pessimist towards every party, and it's like, well, they're all terrible, they're all wrong. But it's interesting that you never find someone who's positive towards both parties. Like, no one ever says, like, ah, Republican, Democrat, it's, honestly, it's kind of a win-win, right? Like, I, <laughs> Like, I just, I like them all so much, I just, I can't choose which to vote with. Like, um, such great options. No, no one's ever been like, I've never met that kind of person. If they exist, I would like to meet them. We live in an anxious world. People worry about their future. They feel stressed about the present. In light of this, how does God's kingdom 
fit into our lives? And even better yet, how do we fit into God's kingdom? So I'm going to tell a story. And this, um, it's a true story. Um, it's a story about a poem that was written roughly 2,600 years ago. Um, the city of Jerusalem in Israel had just been destroyed by a nation called Babylon. It's a powerful nation to the northeast of Israel. Uh, most of the Jewish people were either killed in battle or they were taken away into exile. Uh, but a few left, a few remained among the city ruins. The city was destroyed, but a few were left in the ruins. These people had witnessed the death of family members, of children, of parents, of friends, of neighbors. Many other loved ones had been taken as prisoners of war, never to be seen again. Those who remained would have had fear and uncertainty for their future and for how they were going to survive. Um, and they were wondering, where is God in all of this? Where is God in all of this? Why did God allow this to happen? See, Jerusalem and the temple, they were supposed to be these places where God would dispense. God would dispense his blessing and peace to everyone. It was a place where the world was supposed to come and to um, receive God's blessing on them. But now the city and the temple are lying in ruins. And there was a prophet named Isaiah who had warned Israel about Israel's fall and their imprisonment and their exile. And Isaiah said that it was their own doing. It's because they had turned away from God, because they had worshipped other gods, and because they ceased to be a just and moral society. For example, one of the examples Isaiah points out is that they had failed to look after widows and orphans, people who were near to the heart of God. And so the prophet Isaiah recorded a poem. In this poem, there is a watchman in the city, uh, standing on the city walls. In the distance, he sees a messenger running towards the city and shouting, the words, good news, good news. And Isaiah says this, he says, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those that bring good news. You see, the feet are beautiful because they are carrying a beautiful message. And the message is this, that despite Jerusalem's destruction, despite the temple lying in ruins, Israel's God still reigns as king. And God himself will one day return to this ruined city he will take up his throne and he will bring peace and comfort to his people. At the message, the watchmen sing for joy at this good news. And then the people of Israel waited in anticipation for this day in which God would come and restore his people. Years go by. A person named Alexander the Great rises up and conquers the known world and he unites the world under the Greek language. Then there's this person of Jesus Christ in the New Testament, uh, who goes around performing miracles and declaring that God's kingdom has, in fact, arrived. God's kingdom is now here. What was surprising about the way Jesus describes the kingdom, it's a, a unique kingdom that Jesus is talking about. It was a kingdom that thrives and advances not by war or bloodshed or rebellion, but it's a kingdom that thrives and advances through peace and love. It's a kingdom where its people are marked by self-sacrifice and generosity instead of by greed. It's a kingdom where its leaders are those who serve, and the first are last and the last are first. And it's a kingdom where both the hungry and the outsider are welcomed to the table. And in Luke chapter 19, just as Isaiah had promised 600 years before, Jesus enters Jerusalem and just like Isaiah had promised, Jesus is exalted. But different than what people had thought, instead of being exalted on a throne, he's exalted on a cross to shouts of crucify him, crucify him. And then God exalted Jesus again after his death by raising him from the dead and by giving him authority to rule and reign over his kingdom. And just as Isaiah had promised, it was by Jesus' death and resurrection that peace comes to God's people. And for all of us, who have sinned, for all of us who were blind, for all of us who are poor before God with nothing to offer, this is good news. There is a king, and to live in this kingdom is to have peace with God. It is to have 
ultimate security, ultimate safety, even if living in the most dangerous of areas. It is to have inner peace, despite living busy and hectic lives. And it is to have joy, regardless of what the kingdoms of this world are doing or who their leaders might be. The good news now is that Jesus has defeated sin and death, and he reigns as king. But the story does not end there. Jesus then sends his followers out to proclaim this good news of God's reign and to invite everyone to give allegiance to him, the king who defeated death with his love. That is, in a nutshell, I think, the story of the Bible. And it is um, the kingdom that Isaiah was pointing to, and it is the kingdom that Christ claims that he has established and instituted. So our passage this morning is looking at Luke chapter 4, uh, verses 31 through 44. Um, last week, if you remember, if you were here, we, uh, we saw that Jesus announces his ministry by quoting again from Isaiah. Isaiah is an important book for the New Testament authors and for Jesus. He quotes from Isaiah 61, and this is what Isaiah 61 says that Jesus then applies to his ministry. He says this, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor, he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, and to set the oppressed free and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. So the passage this morning starts off with Jesus um, going to Capernaum. So we have a map, I think, that we can show you. It might be a little hard to see all the areas, but to the north of that map, to the top of it, is the area of Galilee, and to the south is where Jerusalem is. Jesus' ministry in Luke chapters four through nine, happen entirely in this northern region of Galilee. Chapters four through nine, that's primarily all where Jesus is the entire time. In chapter nine, there's, um, Luke records the, what's called the transfiguration. Um, and then after that, it says that Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. And the way Luke describes it is he calls it Jesus' departure. Now in the Greek language, the word that's used there for departure is the, the Greek word Exodus. It's a, a significant word. Um, if you know anything about uh, Israel's history and their great exodus, it's interesting that Luke chooses that word to describe uh, Jesus' heading for Jerusalem, that it's his exodus. But we'll get to more of that when we get to Luke chapter 9. Um, but you see that um, Jesus is primarily in the north. Then from chapters 9 to 19 is kind of describing his journey to Jerusalem. And on chapter 19 is when he enters Jerusalem. Um, chapter 22, he has the Lord's Supper, and he's betrayed. Chapter 23, he's crucified. Chapter 24, he's resurrected. And then after that, Luke begins his second volume, what we call the book of Acts. So that's in a nutshell the, the book of Luke. So when you get to verse 32, um, one of the things I want to point out, there's a few areas I'm going to mention here, but um, when you get to verse 32, it says that they were amazed at Jesus' teaching because his words had authority. They were amazed at Jesus' teaching because his words had authority. So what is unique about Jesus' teaching is that he taught as if he himself were the authority. Now, this is unusual for people teaching in Jesus' time, in Jesus' day. If you were a rabbi or you were a teacher in that period, you never claimed things on your own authority. You always referenced someone before you, someone who had authority, someone who had reputation, uh, reputation, someone who had esteem. So for example, if I were teaching, I would say, according to Moses, right? And then you would say what Moses said, or according to Isaiah, the prophet, or according to David, the king. You would reference people before you. That's where authority came from, is it came from the scriptures. It came from the people before. What's interesting is you see in actually the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, Jesus is saying quite different. He's saying, oh, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I tell you, I tell you, love your, your enemy. And you see, Jesus is teaching from his own authority. He's not referencing the scriptures. He's a, he often applies them to himself and shows how he is fulfilling them. But they're amazed by the, his teaching with authority. Um, but it's not just that. It's Because it, that would just be sort of audacious claims. That kind of raises the question, like, okay, Jesus, who are you then? Who are you to be saying these things? So it's, it's important that Jesus not only says these things about God's kingdom, but then Jesus actually defends it by the miracles that he performs following it, um, in conjunction with what he proclaims. He is healing people. He's casting out demons. He is doing ministry to the people that he is proclaiming to. 
Um, so Jesus is not just boldly teaching on his authority. He's, def- he's defending what he's saying. He's backing up his actions. So Jesus, in, this, in verses 33 through 41, we see Jesus is healing both those who are physically sick and those who are spiritually sick. And in doing so, Jesus confirms his kingship. He's healing those who are physically sick and spiritually sick, and by doing so, he's confirming his kingship. I think this is important um, because some churches want to place a, a heavy focus on, on just proclaiming. Um, we, we just go around, we just tell everyone about God, about Jesus, about his kingdom, um, and, and there's great things with that. But sometimes those people then don't do anything to serve or to help or to benefit the lives of the people that they're proclaiming to. Other churches kind of go the other extreme, where it's like we, we go and we build homes for people or we go do all these missions, and we never once tell them that we're Christians or why exactly we're doing these things that we do. Um, and so it's important that we keep this in balance, that it's Jesus here is proclaiming, he's speaking, but he's also healing, and he's, um, he's helping people in their situations of life also. And I think this is the model for us as well, that it's one with the other, that we, we are modeling, we are demonstrating what God's kingdom means when we are helping people in the process. Um, now, some of you, when you get to verse 41, you may have a question um, This is an interesting situation where you see a demon who is proclaiming that Jesus is the Son of God, and Jesus rebukes the demon and tells the demon to be quiet, and it says this, because because they knew that he was the Messiah. Now, this is strange on a number of levels. Uh, Number one, why would Jesus not want people to know he's the Messiah? Why would Jesus rebuke and tell these demons to be silent? So, this question has been bothering me this week, and I have been um, trying to find an answer. I've um, looked at different commentaries. Um, and so after studying on this question for a while, I can come before you confidently and say that I have a very sure and definitive answer to this question. And my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> I, I have not found an answer that I was, thought was satisfactory. There's about three in my mind that might be possible, but I, I don't I, I just don't feel good about any of them, so I, I don't feel like it's even worth mentioning them, honestly. So I feel like I have failed you this week. Um, I apologize. We will reimburse your admission fee when you came in on your way out. Um, I do feel like I need to redeem myself, so I just want to add uh, something that's not. This is free. It's not from the text. Um, some of you might wonder, um, do dogs make it to the kingdom of, he- uh, kingdom of God? And I, I just want to tell you absolutely, confidently, yes, they do. Dogs make it. Now, cats do not. Cats, 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 are, too, cats are too selfish and prideful to make the cut. Um, in fact, we're teaching my daughter, who's a little over a year and a half, on how to make animal sounds or, you know, and, um, and so if you ask her, what does a cat say, um, we taught her to cross her arms and to go, hmm. <laughs> and she has the, she has the hmm down, but she does, her crossing arms doesn't always work. But um, I've also learned that she never performs when you want her to. When you, when you ask her to in front of people, she... she anyways, I, I'm probably ruining any um, advertisement for this parenting seminar in two weeks. You're, you're probably not... Um, so Jesus is healing people. Uh, it points to three different things, I think. Three different things that Jesus' healing points to. Number one, it shows his power over the physical world. It shows his power over the physical world. And Luke's going to show this again when he calms the storm and all these different things that Jesus does. It shows his power over the physical world. That he can speak and things come into existence. Now, when you hear that, that Jesus can speak and things come into existence, you should immediately be thinking of Genesis chapter 1, the creation of the, the world, the creation of the earth, that God spoke and things came into existence. Um, number two is it shows God's concern for those who are hurting. Um, quite simply, God is concerned. God loves and has compassion on people who are hurting and suffering. Um, that's just a reality, and it's good that we embrace that and, and know that. Um, and number three, and I think this is maybe most significant, it is a, a foretaste or a preview of humanity's greatest sickness, um, which is ultimately death. 
Um, Jesus, by healing, is pointing, foreshadowing, um, in a sense, the ultimate healing that we have as, as believers, as those who follow Christ. And that is that one day he will not only heal our sicknesses, he will not only heal our, our body's weaknesses, but one day he will heal us from death itself. And I think that this is a part of, again, what is happening here when Jesus is healing people. It's foreshadowing this ultimate healing that God will, will bring and fulfill. Um, so the final thing I want to discuss is Jesus' pur- purpose statement in verse 43. So Jesus' purpose is to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom. He's to proclaim the good news of God's kingdom. Uh, verse 43 says, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns also, because that is why I was sent. Um, and so there's a few ideas I want to address here from this one sentence. So first of all, this word must. I must proclaim the good news. Now this is not saying that Jesus is forced against his will as if he has no freedom or no control. In fact, if you remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the temptations of Christ and how that was ultimately an attempt to derail Jesus' mission to die on the cross, uh, the temptations there. And so um, Jesus obviously had a choice, but when he says here, I must do these things, what it is showing is it is portraying Jesus as one who is singly, single-focused, single-focused on completing the will of God. He had a choice, and his choice was to serve and obey and love the Father um, with his life. So Jesus, if you remember again a couple weeks ago, he had eternity in mind. And that is, again, a part of what living in the kingdom of God means, is that we have eternity in mind. We look beyond the shallow, temporal, earthly things, um, and we, we look to how things are seen from a perspective of eternity. And that shapes the way and it shapes the decisions that we make here and now. Jesus lived with eternity in mind, even at the cost of his own suffering and pain temporarily. Jesus had our eternity in mind. Uh, Secondly is this word proclaim. Uh, When we think of the word proclaim, we think that um, obviously it's verbal, it's speaking, uh, and this is correct. Some translations will use the word preach here. I don't love that word choice for translations because for one, oftentimes we think that preaching is only something that happens here. And if we ever hear of someone preaching outside of church, it's never a positive. It's always like he was preaching at me or he was preaching, you know, um, if I go to a supermarket and, I, and someone is, I see someone preaching at someone, it's never a positive connotation. So I don't like that term for here. Proclaim is, I think, a better term. But it's important here to remind you that it's not just Jesus is speaking that is proclaiming, but it's also his actions that is proclaiming. It's the things that he is doing. He is demonstrating the kingdom of God and his authority as king by what he says, but also by what he does. And so we we can't separate that from what Jesus is proclaiming. Um, And so here's also the question. Would people have believed that Jesus is the Messiah had he not demonstrated God's kingdom along with his message? And I think this should be a message for us as we seek to proclaim God's kingdom to those around us. That we need to live lives that demonstrate, demonstrate that Christ actually is our king and that he is our authority. And then the next thing is this uh, phrase, because that is why I was sent. So this, here is the purpose of Jesus' life. It's his self-identity of why Jesus came. Whenever Jesus says, this is the reason I was sent, Uh, We should probably pay attention because it's probably pretty important. Uh, Now, I suspect that if you went to most churches across America and you asked them, why is it that God became flesh and lived on earth? Most people would probably not say to proclaim God's kingdom. That's not the first thing that would come to their mind. But should it be? Are Are we oftentimes so focused on heaven and so focused on afterlife that we forget that God's kingdom impacts how we live here and now? Um, and so I think we need to maybe bring back this emphasis that I, I think sometimes churches have lost. Um, and kind of winding up, so I want to just talk a, a little bit about this difference of kingdom of God in our lives personally. Um, for me, this is, again, personal. Um, I hope it's 
true for many here. The more and more that I understand myself as a citizen of God's kingdom, the more that I understand myself as a citizen of God's kingdom, the less anxious I feel about life. The more I understand myself as a citizen of God's kingdom, the less I worry about the future. The less, the more I understand, the less I try to impress others by the things I do. Also, the more I understand myself as a citizen of God's kingdom, the less passionate I become about American politics. The less likely I live for the weekend. The less likely I work to get ahead in life. And the less likely I hoard resources and live a stingy life. This good news of God's kingdom impacts our lives here and now. And it, it needs to be said that it oftentimes can sound crazy to people who have not heard it before. Um, this idea of an upside-down kingdom, where the first are last, the last are first, where the poor are blessed and the rich have trouble making it um, into heaven. It's hard for people to believe. It's hard for our world to believe. It goes counter to how our world operates in many ways. And I think that's, that's why it is important that it's not just that we proclaim God's kingdom. It's not just that we speak God's kingdom, but that we demonstrate God's kingdom in the way that we live here and now. That we demonstrate that Jesus is really the king of the world and that we believe that. So just as Jesus demonstrated the kingdom of God by his actions, so do we. And I wonder, how else could the world believe this message? How else could the world believe? How would the world know that God is a gracious and generous God if we live tight-fisted, selfish lives? How will the world believe that about God? How will the world believe that God loves every person if we are apathetic or indifferent towards our neighbors? How will the world believe that God is hospitable and welcomes everyone to his table um, if we never open our homes and share meals with others? And it's this last point that I want to focus on for our application. Uh, there are many metaphors that the Bible uses to describe the kingdom of God. It's not just one metaphor. There's many metaphors that the Bible uses. But I think my favorite metaphor is that of a meal around a dinner table. Um, oftentimes we see this metaphor all through Scripture to refer to or to as an analogy of the kingdom of God. But what is interesting is that it wasn't just a metaphor in Jesus' life. Jesus himself actually practiced and lived out table fellowship here on earth. He had food and meals were an important aspect of his ministry. Um, not only did Jesus eat with his disciples, but he was— <coughs> Not only did he eat with his disciples, but he was intentional about inviting to the table those who were on the outside. He invited the poor, the outcast, the sinners, and even the hated tax collectors in society. And so this week, um, I want to make a challenge to each and every person here this week, is to make an appointment at some point throughout this week to invite a neighbor or a co-worker to your house. It doesn't matter if they're a Christian, not a Christian. Um, invite a neighbor or a co-worker to your house. Um, if to your house is my personal recommendation um, to, for dinner. Now, if for some reason you find that impossible or difficult to invite to your house, um, you can invite them out to eat. So, for example, uh, maybe you're a person who owns cats. Um, you, you will want to invite them out, out to eat. So, um, But I wonder, like, what would happen if we as a church, what would happen if we as a church began this practice of regularly having people into our lives, inviting them into our homes, sharing meals together in the same way that Jesus shared meals. Now, we're not getting to there yet, but it's interesting. Jesus practiced table fellowship. He practiced these sharing meals. And when you get to Luke 22, the Lord's Supper, Jesus does this meal again with his disciples, and then in that, he, he turns to them and he says, do this in remembrance of me. And the question is, do what in remembrance of Jesus? And do, do what exactly in remembrance of Jesus? In light of all that Jesus has been practicing, is in some way, is sharing meals like this with, with other people, is this part of what Jesus is commanding us to do? 
Um, again, we'll get to that more later. I hope that we can demonstrate God's hospitality, that he welcomes all to the table by the way that we live here in this life. So I mentioned at the very beginning that um, Isaiah had recorded this poem about the destruction of Jerusalem, what will happen after the fall, and about the watchmen who are coming. I just want to read for you from Isaiah chapter 52, verses 7 through 10, and I think the passage should show up on the screen. This is that poem that was written about 2,600 years ago. It says this, How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those that bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring good tidings, who proclaim salvation, who say to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your watchmen lift up their voices. Together they shout for joy. When the Lord returns to Zion, they will see it with their own eyes. Burst into songs of joy together, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord will lay bare his holy arm in the, the sight of all the nations and all the ends of the earth. All the ends of the earth will see the salvation of our God. Let us pray. God, I pray that our hearts would be shaped and moved so that we desire to demonstrate your kingdom, while we also proclaim it to those around us. And so, God, give us the courage, give us the motivation, um, give us the discipline to be faithful and to demonstrate you as king over our lives. And, um, God, to show that what it looks like to live in the kingdom of God, that it is different and it is unique kingdom. And it's hard for people to believe. And so, God, we pray that you will be um, helping us to speak truth and to speak love to those around us. God, we pray that you'll use us for this purpose, and we ask in your name. Amen.